I am Jake Lizio, and this is day two of my five-day blues course. If you recall, last time we learned the basic 12-bar blues and the 1-4-5 chords and the general idea of the blues structure. And today, what we are going to do is improve upon that. We're going to, um, basically, let's take a look at our syllabus here for today. We're going to have uh, some information on a quick change and a turnaround. And those are two really, really simple modifications that we make to our 12-bar jam. They're very common, and uh, they have this nice little lingo that you can throw around and tell people what you want to do in a jam, and they understand it just by understanding these words, quick change and turn around. And we've also really just only been focusing on seventh chords. And seventh chords are cool, right? And they're nice and bluesy, but, you know, it can be really boring and really limiting to just be doing seventh chords all day. The cool thing about the blues is you have a wide variety of notes to choose from. You can pick almost any note and find a way to fit it into the blues, as opposed to, you know, um, a lot of other genres where they stick to one scale. So when we start throwing in some of these more interesting chords, like dominant ninth chords, 13th chords, 7th sharp 9 chords, these are really uh, interesting chords that can find their home easily in the blues because the blues just has so much versatility and so many options there. And when you're playing rhythm guitar, you don't want to just be stuck to one chord. So the idea here is expand our, our abilities when we are jamming as a rhythm guitarist in a 12-bar jam. You know, a lot of rhythm guitarists... Um, the, the goal of being a good rhythm guitarist is support. You're supporting the band. You're supporting your lead guitar player. It's really easy, actually, to learn a pentatonic scale and to go up and down it and say, hey, I'm playing lead. It's way harder to do this, this stuff that we're talking about, and that's holding down the fort as a rhythm guitar player and really understanding what is your role, how can we make this, this simple strophic form song. I mean, we've only got 12 measures, right? How do we make that interesting? Well, that's what a rhythm guitarist is going to do. They're not just going to play the same chords and in the same inversions and the same shape. They're going to do some improvements on that. And that's what I'd like to talk about at the end of this lesson is rhythm guitar concepts. What can we do as a rhythm guitarist to really hold down the fort and do our job well and have some variety and not just be stuck in the same three spots all day, right? We will do a lead lesson. That'll be, I believe, in the next day's lesson. But today it's mainly about rhythm and expanding our possibilities here. So... Um, let's take a look at what we're starting off with. The quick change and the turnaround, two extremely simple concepts. The quick change is simply the word we use right here when we play a four chord on the second measure. If you recall, our 12-bar blues, this was supposed to be a one chord, right? Like, let's say I'm in the key of G, right? I'm supposed to have a measure of G, and then another measure of G, then another measure of G, and a fourth measure of G, right? And then finally, the four chord is supposed to come up. But here, the quick change means just right away, right after that first measure, we switch to the four, and then back to the one, then the four for two measures, right? You can hear that gives you a little bit more excitement, a little bit more energy. It doesn't prolong that tonic chord as long, right? So let's hear it again. Here's the end of the jam. Now I repeat. Quick change, four, back to one, right? So it's not like it's better or worse than my normal 12-bar jam. I don't want you to think of that as better or worse. I just want you to think of it as a possibility. For me personally, I think if I'm doing like a really slow blues, it's nice to have that quick change because it avoids that droning of the tonic chord for so long. Um, but, you know, you can get away. It depends on what kind of blues I'm working with. Sometimes I want to hear four long measures of the one chord, especially if there's some really soulful vocals on top. You know, that nice long period of one chord gives us a nice bed to sing on top of. But if I need something more interesting, you know, maybe my blues is sounding a little boring, then maybe you bring in a quick change just to kind of keep things a little bit more interesting. And this is pretty common verbiage. Most blues players know what you're talking about. You say, hey, we're doing 12 bar and A with a quick change. Even if you've never practiced with that band before, you should be able to keep up with the changes immediately because you know that, hey, the quick change just means on that second measure, I switch to a four chord instead of staying on a one chord. The turnaround. Turnaround is another little phrase that we use a lot, and it can mean a lot of things. The, the, the simplest thing it means is that we're throwing a five chord in at the end. And in case you didn't know, the five chord here, this is a really, really stupidly important chord. Let's go back to G. Our five chord is D, right? And we usually make it a D7. And that means uh, the D7 in the key of G, that five chord, that's called the dominant chord. D7 takes us back to G very strongly. This, this five chord pulls us to the one chord. That's why it's called the dominant chord. It has dominant function. This is a really important chord change, five to one. So by throwing it in at the very, very end of my jam, it kind of helps close this loop, right? It helps me repeat 
my 12 bar jam a little bit easier, right? So I'll just, you'll hear it. Here's my one chord. My second line is the four chord. Again, on four, back to one. Last line, five chord. Four, one, and now listen to the quick chain, or the turn around, back to one. And you hear that five really builds up the tension to come resolving back down to that G. So it's a really nice addition to throw that five in at the end. I personally, when I'm making blues, I have a tendency to use the turnaround a lot. I just love it so much there. It creates all that tension. You can do a drum fill there. You can do an awesome fill there. Really build things up with a crescendo and then come crashing back to the one chord. Now, I will say the turnaround can be more than just the five chord at the end. Sometimes the turnaround even starts way back here on this measure. So turnaround can mean like a general ending to help us repeat. And sometimes turnarounds can be pretty complicated. Sometimes turnarounds can include more chords than just the one, the four, and the five. For example, a really common one is the one to the six, to the two, to the five. And we're not gonna talk about twos and sixes in this video, but if you know your diatonic chords, you might realize that, oh yeah, that could work as a turnaround to take me back to G. So the word turnaround can mean a lot more. Right now we're kind of keeping things simple. It's just the five chord at the end, but you know, keep in mind, especially in jazz and advanced, uh, blues, you're going to see more advanced turnarounds than just that. So here's the language, right? You're work with a with a blues band without ever having practiced, with having met musicians for the first time. You say, hey, let's do a 12 bar blues in D. I want to swing it, and I want a quick change and a turnaround. You know, and now the whole band plays an awesome jam, never having communicated or practiced or worked with together because they all understand this language. And if they're all good musicians, that's going to be an incredible sounding jam. You know, just because it's a cookie cutter format doesn't mean that it has to sound soulless or that it has to sound uh, uninspired. You know what I mean? Cookie cutter formats are all over the place, but it's what people inject into it. It's how they inject their own style and their own skills and their own perspective is what makes these cookie cutter formats sound so interesting and enjoyable. So that is the idea of the quick change and the turnaround. Pretty simple stuff, in my opinion. Now, what I'd like to do is start improving on some of these chords. You know, right now, I've only been using seventh chords. And like I said, I think seventh chords are pretty cool. But what about ninth chords? If you remember, to build a seventh chord, what we did, um, let's go back to G. We took a major chord, and that's just the notes G, B, D. And then we add the flatted seventh. So that's like going up the seven notes of the scale. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then we flat it. And that was a flatted seventh. We add that note to our major chord to get a dominant seventh. Now we take all those same notes and we add the ninth note of the scale. All right. The second note or the ninth note is the same thing. And here's what I mean. If I count up nine notes of my G scale, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. The ninth note of my G scale is just the note A. Well, look at the second note of my G scale. G, A, it's A. So seconds and ninths are the same thing. You just want to remember that. The reason I'm calling it a ninth is because it's an octave higher. It's, it is, you know, displaced by a full octave. And there's really no practical way as a guitar player for me to play a G7 and somehow play this A. Like, I don't know how to do that. There's really no, you know, convenient way. And it's going to sound gross. You don't want those notes in the low register. So instead, what we do is we take that ninth note, that B, and we play it higher. And I'm just going to play it right here. Pretty simple chord to play. If you already know how to play a G7, that's what this is. You just tack your pinky on here. You got yourself a G ninth. All right. And you might be able to hear it's got a little more color than G7. Right? It's got a little bit of brightness to it. A little bit brighter of a chord than just G7. G7 to me is a dirty major. Really dirty major. G9 is like a slightly cleaner but more bright dirty major. It's a nice feel, but I really like this voicing. Check out this voicing on the fifth string. I'm going to find G on my fifth string. That'll be the tenth fret. And this is again a G9, but I love the way it comes together on my guitar in this voicing. So G9, wonderful substitution for G7. Let's say I'm doing a 12 bar blues in G and I get sick of this G7. I can just tack in that G9 and it's gonna give me a little bit of interest, right? I like to switch back forth between my sevenths and my ninths or maybe come on up here for that G9. So what I'm trying to tell you is that any one of these chords could be replaced with a ninth chord. Just try it out, experiment with it. Instead of using seventh chords, literally make every one of these a ninth chord and hear what your 12 bar sounds like. In addition to ninths, you really want to be looking at chords like the 13th. Once again, the 13th is the same thing as the 6th. 
but a lot of times we add it an octave higher, so we call it a 13th. And the shape here could be pretty simple. There's a lot of ways we could play this, right? But um, we're just going to play it pretty simply here by, once again, playing like a G7. You can see here's my root, here's my fifth, here's my flat seven, my major third, and here's a 13th or a sixth. And I get this guy. All right, you hear it? It's got a little funk to it. It's got a little, you know, grime to it. And I like how old-timey the addition of the sixth sounds. So if I wanted maybe a more crusty-sounding blues, listen to my G7 and then a C9. Right? Hopefully you're hearing already this is getting way more interest than my uh, than the previous 12-bar blues. Let's make them both 13. So I'm going to play G13 on the 1 chord. I'm going to play C13 on the 4 chord. So I've got G13 and C13. Right? Isn't this starting to get almost more jazzy? You might start getting like a jazz flavor out of this. I still feel it as blues just because uh, I'm not that good with jazz. <laughs> But you hear it's way more interesting and it's way more color. And it still holds that 12 bar format together. Just more bluesy, way more soul going on there. Last, I mean, we could go all day with this, right? We could go into, there's tons of jazz chords and we'll talk a little bit at the end. But really, I just want to give you a few, what I consider the best substitutions. You know, you could go all day, but I think these are the real, like the holy trinity of, of, of substitutions. You're going to have your ninth chord, your 13th chord, and your seven sharp nine. Seven sharp nine is what we consider an altered dominant chord. Now, this is as gross as our music theory might get, um, so just bear with me here. A seventh chord, you already know what a seventh chord is. We've learned that. When you add the sharped nine, and you already know what a nine is, right? That's the second note of the scale. Well, it's just like sharp it, and it becomes a sharp nine. That is the same thing as a, as a minor third or a flatted third, and if you don't know what that means, that's fine, but really, uh, the heart of blues is when you have something like a major chord, like G major, right? Take a G major. G major has a natural B in it. It has a major third in it. And when you start discoloring your G major with B flats, right, it starts creating that blues sound. So this is about as bluesy as of a chord as you can get, in my opinion. It is a seventh chord that includes a minor third, but we're going to call it a sharp nine just to be technically correct. And let's listen to what it sounds like in E. Here's an E7 sharp nine. Listen to that wonderful... That's a Jimi Hendrix chord. You know, Jimi Hendrix, half of his career is built off of this single, you know, uh, this single chord as far as his rhythm is concerned. So you hear how discolored it is, how um, almost alarming of a chord it is. It's really going to, you know, gross things up in the blues setting. You can also do it here in the low inversion. Here it is in G. I'm starting on the third fret. And it's got a very, you know, harebrained effect to it. I will be honest. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be putting this in all over the place. I wouldn't be throwing the seven sharp nine in all over the place. What I would be doing it is specifically on the five chord. I would kind of use this as a trick up my sleeve every time the five chord comes up. So like right here, I would think about using it. And then maybe on the turnaround, I would think about using it because it's really going to create this strange kind of like, whoa, what's happening? And then it rushes us back to the tonic. Let's take a listen. All right. I'm going to play this uh, in the key of G. I'll have a, let's do um, G6, another G6. Here's my four chord, I'll make it C9. And back to G6, G3, or G9. Now the five chord is a seventh. Four chord, one chord. Now listen to that seven sharp nine. Right? That can take me back. It's just this gross dissonance in that chord, and I love it. I think it's a really, really, really cool chord. And it is called an altered dominant. An altered dominant, uh, we're not going to go too far into this. You don't really need to know it, but it's when you have a seventh chord, and either the fifth or the uh, ninth has been uh, altered. Uh, that it would be considered an altered dominant chord. And we usually see them off the five position like that because they create so much tension. So... What we have here is we hopefully have a lot to practice, right? If you are unfamiliar with seven sharp nines, if you're unfamiliar with dominant thirteens, if you're unfamiliar with nines, this is going to be a lot of work. And I'm only giving you two shapes for each chord. I'm giving you a shape on the sixth string, and I'm giving you a shape on the fifth string. So it would be highly advised for you to take all this information and apply it in the way that you think is the most helpful, right? Try to maybe find inversions that you like, or use your own chord books, or see if you already know chord shapes, or maybe you're on a different instrument, maybe you're not on a guitar. All this stuff applies to the piano or the ukulele if you're playing blues uke. I'm not sure if that's really a thing, but this all applies to the same thing. You're just going to need to learn different shapes to do it. So I would highly recommend you learn as many shapes as this stuff as possible, but if you're not familiar with it, keep it easy. 
just give yourself one shape. Say, I'm going to learn how to play ninths on the sixth string today. That's going to be my focus. And then, you know, tomorrow maybe add in a different shape. But this takes a lot of time to get all these shapes memorized. So divide and conquer. You know, pick your battles. If you can't learn all this stuff, just say, okay, I'm going to learn my ninths. And then once you've got your ninths mastered, you know, go on to some thirteenths. And, and don't just use my shapes here. I am just giving you the shapes that I thought would be easiest to teach. But, you know, I mean, there's a million ways to play a thirteenth chord. There's a million ways to play a seventh chord. Now, what I'd like to talk about is what are we supposed to do with all this stuff? We've got the chords, we've got the structure. Yeah, but that still doesn't take care of what is our job as a rhythm guitarist. So basically every single thing I'm about to tell you here could be an entire lesson, all right? Like I could make an entire lesson video out of every one of these topics. So I'm gonna try to go nice and quick here with it, but keep in mind that you can really go deep into each one of these things I'm talking about and make it a core component of your playing and of your, you know, your performance and of your style. So uh, if I'm a rhythm guitarist and somebody says, hey, we're playing a 12 bar in D, quick change, turn around, uh, you know, shuffle it. Okay, so I got a swing in D, in, in D and I'm going to be doing, you know, all that stuff. I got a quick change and a turn around. I could palm mute each chord while strongly playing on the downbeats, right? So here's my D7, right? And let's say my tempo is one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. So, palm muting that chord, strongly playing the downbeats. No, the three, four. My ands are these, see how quiet my upbeats are? And then occasionally lifting off these palm mutes to create a little bit of rhythmic interest. So, like, it's like a half. You know, I'm palm muting half of the chord while I'm playing at the exact same time. And you hear it's interesting, right? It's way more interesting than if I just did. I mean, how many times have you heard somebody do this, right? The same strumming pattern. Down, down, up, up, down, up, down, down, up. So at least now we're doing all downstrokes. We're doing something interesting. We get to really be creative with where are we throwing in our palm mutes? Where are we lifting off our palm mutes? And if you can do that, then, you know, think about adding in some 16th notes. One and two and a three and four and one e and two and three and a four e and a one and two and three and four and, and two and a three e and a four and, right? So that's one idea there. We could also just play the thin strings on each chord, right? In a really staccato fashion. So we're not, we're just ignoring the low notes all together. These thick strings, sixth string, fifth string, fourth string, screw those. We're not even going to talk about those. We're really going to focus on these thin strings. First string, second string, third string. So like, let's go back to G, right? And instead of playing the low notes, what if I just did like one, two, three, and four, and one, two, three, and four, one, two, three, right? And here's a C9 coming up. Right? You hear how nice that sounds, just playing those high notes? It's interesting, but I want to keep in mind, it's really going to be more interesting if you've got a band to back you up. This is the kind of thing that sounds really good if, you know, you've got a keyboard player playing there and you've got a bass player, they're covering the low range. Well, now you don't have to worry about this low G. Why do you got to be playing this low G? It doesn't even sound that good. So why not just, you know, real staccato high stuff to kind of pop out in the mix? Really great way to compliment your band as a rhythm guitar player and not do that same boring strumma, strumma, strumma. I mean, that gets really lame, and a lot of people never realize that that's all they're doing is just strumming the same stinking chord over and over again. So just a little staccato chord stab makes a big difference. You know, I'm just lifting off my hand right away. As soon as I'm done with that chord, I'm not even using my picking hand to rest it. I'm just kind of, you know, stop pushing with your thumb, and the chord just disappears like that. Nice stab in the face of a seventh chord, sixth chord, ninth chord. Cool stuff. Alternatively, complete opposite thing. Just play the low notes of each one of these chords. Instead of playing on the high notes, just play the no low notes. Listen, if I'm really low on this G, if I'm just playing like the low notes, listen to what I get. And here's the low notes, the C7. This is way more rocking. This is like a blues rock, right? By avoiding those high notes, we're getting this really muddy territory, which works really good for blues rock, right? Compare this, I'm going to open up the chord here in a second, and listen to how different it sounds. Back to the full chord now, right? That's a whole different feel. 
That to me feels like part A of my song, part B of my song. And I created two different parts of the song just by changing my rhythm. That's what rhythm guitar players do. You know, if you're doing the same strumming pattern all day long, your rhythm part's gonna sound boring. But I can switch up the feel, you know, keep it real low with palm mutes, make it really loud with Phil strums, keep it really staccato with those chord stabs, or, you know, get this rocking sound by just focusing on those low notes. Notice what I said here, add the sixth. The sixth is this note right here. If you're playing a, a G power chord, and if you can stick your pinky out an extra two frets, you get that note. And that's your classic blues shuffle, right? So imagine taking a 12 bar blues, quick change, and doing this on every single chord. You've heard this. You've heard this a hundred times before. And it's still a 12 bar blues, but instead of playing seventh chords, instead of playing ninth chords, we're just doing like these power chords with added sixth. So it's important to remember, this 12 bar format doesn't even have to be played with full chords. It can be played with power chords. It can be played with riffs. You could play a riff and then move it up a fourth and then move it down a root and then move it up to a fifth, you know, and you'll have a 12 bar riff. So the structure is very, very versatile. How about this? How about you alternate between playing notes of the bass note and a few of the high notes? So something like this. Uh, let's say I am on, uh, once again, my G. We're just going to stay here in G. And I've got my big G7, right? Just playing the bass note and then playing the high notes. Bass note, then strum. And like one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four. And for C. Some low notes, then high notes. Low notes, then high. Really good contrast. You know, low and high is like a very, very fundamental um, contrast to know as a rhythm guitar player. Even without the staccato stuff. Listen, if I just do low, 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 high, low, high. You can see I'm strumming some low notes and I'm getting out of some high notes. It gives me some, you know, real nice variety. So... What I'm trying to say is don't just strum all the notes all the time, unless that's the goal, unless you're going for something that's driving and just blah, 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 blah. There's a time for that. But I feel like, you know, too much of that's going to get really annoying really, really fast. So how about an arpeggio? Who doesn't like an arpeggio? If you don't know an arpeggio, literally just taking the notes of the chord and playing them one at a time. So here's my G13. Take off that pinky. I get a G7. Let's go to C13. And then back to G7, did the nine. Let's do the D7 sharp nine, C9, G7. Right, so all I'm doing is just picking through every note of that entire chord. And uh, what I want you to think about is always kind of starting on the root note, right? It's pretty, uh, pretty important to start on that root note. Um, if you don't do that, uh, it can kind of disturb the chord a little bit. I mean, it's not a rule. You, plenty of times you cannot start on the root note. My advice, if you're beginning with arpeggiating, is, you know, if you're playing a G7, make the first note you pick a G. Then you can pick whatever you want. When you're picking through a C, start with a C. Um, it's not a 100% rule. It's just some general advice if you're starting. Here's a fun one, okay? You can approach each chord from below the chord. This is way outside of the key, and I hopefully you get the idea already that blues is not just, you know, the seven notes of a major scale or something like that. It gets really messy. And one of the cool things we can do is every single chord in our key, we can just start a half step below it and slide up to it, right? So here's what I mean by that. Here is my G chord, right? G7. A half step underneath it is F sharp. Listen, if I just start on F sharp and bump it into G7, listen to what I get. Again. You've got to keep it fast. You can't do it, you know. Here I just slid up to C from the half step below. Again to G. I'll do it to the five chord. Here's a D flat to, to D. And then a B to a C. Right? Really cool effect. But you have to be careful with this because if you don't let your bass player know that you're doing this, you know, you can get into some trouble. I also recommend you don't do that starting on the one beat. Don't do one and. Try like and one, two, and three. Right? The, the weird note, the note that is a half step before it's supposed to be, that's actually going to be uh, before the beat. And then later on, you'll land on the beat. Right? So... Um, it looks like we've got one more here, and this is a really, really fun and simple one, kind of similar to what we just talked about. And that is the idea of bridging the gap between our four chord and our five chord. You know by now that my four chord here is C major, right? And my five chord is going to be D major, or, you know, C7 and D7. 
that's a whole step. There's two frets in between there, and there's this little guy in between. That, that tritone exists in between. And believe it or not, you can hit that tritone, that note in between those two. You can use that to bridge that gap, and it sounds great. So, like, if I'm coming from my five to my four, listen to what it sounds like to, to hit that note in between. And then back to my one chord. You can even do it on the way up. There's to my five chord, and then down. But once again, something like this, you're going to want to let your bass player know about it, you know, or your piano player so they can compliment it. But you can even get away with it, even if they're not aware, you know what I mean? A lot of this stuff is going to work as long as it's done fast enough. Um, you know, uh, you can sneak in, you can almost get away with murder in the blues as long as what you're doing doesn't, you know, disturb the tonic chord for too long. So uh, something like this, you know, F sharp major is right out. That is like as illegal of a chord as you can imagine in the key of G. And it's working just because we did it so quick. We're not starting there. We're not ending there. It's just like a pickup chord to get you to G, right? So I think that is um, a lot to go through, right? If I would really just pick one of these techniques that you find the most interesting and the one that you might find the most entertaining to work with. Uh, so um, I believe that's going to do it for most of this lesson. And uh, yeah, I believe that's going to be in here for today. So next, uh, next lesson, what we're going to be learning, and let's take a quick look at the syllabus for next week. Oh, wait, no, I've got a little bit of practice uh, ideas here for you. What I want you to practice for this entire thing. What I would suggest you practice today, if you have the opportunity, is play a 12 bar in G with all ninth chords. And here's how I recommend you do that. I have included, I have included um, this little track here in my practice resources. In case you didn't know, check the description. I have practice resources, MP3s, PDFs. One of the PDFs is in the key of G, or I'm sorry, one of the MP3s is this, Blues in G, No Rhythm Guitar. Take a listen. This is a drum, uh, bass guitar, drums, and organ. No guitar at all. And this gives you the freedom to start jamming like this. I want you to start playing around with doing a 12 bar with all ninth chords. And let's listen to what that would sound like. Starting here on G, I'm gonna play my G9. G9, C9, G9. Another G9. Here comes the four chord, C9. G9, oops, D9, C9, G9, turn around, all right, so that's how I want you to practice that, and that's what you're going to do with every single one of these. Keep in mind, this, um, this jam does have, the, the one I've included does have a turnaround and does have a quick change. All right. So you, if you've got the PDF, remember this thing you're seeing right now, uh, this giant PowerPoint presentation, you're going to see this screen in there. You can look at this. We're going to be using a quick change and a turnaround for our blues jam in G. And I'd like you to practice doing it all in ninth chords. When you're done with that, do it all with 13th chords, then do it all in G. But every time, or I'm sorry, do it all uh, with anything you want or in any key. Wait, this doesn't make sense. Play a 12 bar in G, any key. Well, that clearly is wrong. This is what it's supposed to say. Play a 12 bar in any key, but use a, an altered dominant, the seven sharp nine for the five chord, just so you start getting familiar with that, right? Then I think a really good project for you would be to write your own 12 bar blues in the key of D. I think D is a cool key because you can start it here. You could start it here and get way up high, really play around with your inversions. And I want you to experiment with where do you play the seventh? Where do you play the ninth? Where do you play the 13th? Where do you play the alter dominant? There are infinite var var like var variations of when are you going to do it? Is it going to have a quick change? Is it not going to have a quick change? You're going to do a turnaround. You're not going to do a turnaround. Is it going to be in 6-8? Is it going to be in 4-4? Four, four? Shuffle, no shuffle. You can still write an entirely unique blues song today just with what we've learned here in two days. And, you know, no one else will have written that song. Yes, it will be a 12 bar like everyone else has done before, but it'll still be unique, 100% unique. So uh, experiment with the placement of each chord. I personally really like bringing in the ninth chord on the second appearance of my four chord, right? So like, not the first time the four chord pops up. Here's the first time it pops up, C7. But the next time we get it, I really like to make it a ninth chord. Listen. Like, it's like a refreshing dissonance. Like, ooh, that was, that was really, really, really cool. So I like to, you know, really save those cool chords and then give them to them when you feel it's necessary. 
Also, I want you to find new ways to play ninth chords. Um, specifically ninth chords, just because those are the most popular, in my opinion. And then later on, find new ways to play thirteenths. Um, these are not the only ways to play it. I don't know every chord shape. I don't know every inversion. And, you know, jazz players, people that are way into blues... I'm not a blues fanatic. Blues is something I learned and I, you know, got as good as I wanted to with it and then I moved on. Um, but there's some people that live in this domain and they're going to have a million cool ways to play ninth chords and, you know, so find some other stuff and you might find that you don't like my shapes at all. And that's cool. You know, there's, there's no one way to play these things. So that is going to be the practice for today. Tomorrow, what we are going to be learning is, I believe, some fun stuff. Yeah. Tomorrow is going to be our lead crash course. Tomorrow we're learning about pentatonic minor, pentatonic major, how they are actually the same thing. That's going to be a heavy-duty lesson on relativity, and um, it might be confusing, but I'm going to try it anyways. It's an extremely difficult topic to get across to people. Connecting our pentatonic shapes, this is a real big problem with guitarists, um, and still with relativity, how major equals minor. We're also going to take a look at the blues scale and why the blues scale exists, how to do it. And what I'm really excited about showing you is important bends. With just a few bends, you can sound like a blues master, and it really doesn't take that much work. Uh, it just takes the right knowledge at the right time, and you can become, like, sound really bluesy with just a little bit of skills. And overall lead concepts. How do you play lead guitar? How do you make it as a good lead player? And what should you really be focused on?